We will start this section with a brief overview of transmission lines and their general operation and characteristics in a power system. A transmission line is a circuit that is used to transmit power from one location to another. These transmission lines can span short distances of a few hundred meters to spanning very long distances in the magnitude of hundreds of kilometers. The two techniques of line protection we will address are distance relaying and line current differential. We will first look at distance relaying. Transmission lines that are protected using distance relays are usually at least one kilometer in length and can reach distances of 750 kilometers or more. Transmission lines consist of conductors that are supported by structures to hold the conductors high above the ground. These conductors are connected to the structure using devices called insulators. These insulators ensure that there is no electrical connection between the conductors and the supporting structure. The structures supporting the conductors can be constructed of wood, metal, or concrete. The material that is used in the structure, the physical arrangement of the components used, and the geography that the conductors and towers are located in greatly affects the electrical properties of the line. All of these factors must be considered when determining the best method of protecting the transmission line. In a power system, the area that constitutes a transmission line is defined by well-defined boundaries. This physical location of a line boundary is often called a terminal. The terminal can be a switch, a breaker, a bus, or a transformer. Transmission lines can be broken down into one of four main classifications that describe their configuration, the function they perform, and their location in the system. Parallel lines describe a configuration where multiple transmission lines run side by side. This is done to transmit large amounts of power from one location to another, in addition to providing a redundant path for power in case one of the lines were shut down due to a fault. Interconnector transmission lines are used to connect one section of a power system to another. Generator export transmission lines are used to transmit power from a generating station to the rest of the grid. Process plant load transmission lines are used to transmit power from transformers or switching stations to large industrial complexes. Transmission lines are classified into three categories that describe the presences of generation or possible sources of fault current that might be found at the transmission line's boundaries. These are single-ended, double-ended, and multi-ended. A single-ended line, also called a radial line, has a source at only one end. This type of line is used to deliver power from the source to a load at the other end of the line. Obviously, whenever a fault occurs, there is only one source of current to feed the fault. A double-ended line has only two boundaries, each of which can have a source of fault current available. This type of line is used to deliver power usually in different directions at different times. If a fault occurs on this transmission line, current will be fed to the fault from two locations. A multi-ended line has more than two boundaries, each of which can have a source of fault current available. At the time of a transmission line fault on this type of line, the direction of normal power flow can be highly variable and the fault will be fed from many different locations. Sometimes the transmission line itself will be tapped to provide a source of power to a load. Distance protection is one method of protecting a transmission line in this configuration and will be covered in detail later in this section. The voltages that are used for transmission of power over transmission lines are split into three categories. These are distribution levels, which are in the range of 2 kilovolts to 50 kilovolts, sub-transmission levels, which are in the range of 30 kilovolts to 150 kilovolts, and transmission levels which are greater than 100 kilovolts. Most applications that use distance protection are 50 kilovolts or greater. The lengths of transmission lines have also been classified into three categories. Short transmission lines are ones that are less than 80 kilometers in length. Medium transmission lines are ones that are roughly between 80 kilometers to 240 kilometers. Long transmission lines are ones that are greater than 240 kilometers in length. Shunt capacitance occurs between the transmission lines and the ground. This capacitance counterbalances some of the inductance by adding leading MVARs on the line and helps bring the current and voltage back to unity power factor. Typical three-phase MVAR values are 1.3 to 1.5 megavars per kilometer for 500 kilovolt lines and 0.15 to 0.4 megavars per kilometer for 230 kilovolt lines. Caution needs to be taken when transmission lines are used with high voltage potentials. Due to the Ferranti effect, the shunt capacitance on the line can become so large that the voltage on the far end of the line can rise higher than the normal line potential. The importance of transmission lines in a power system is quite evident. 
They are responsible for transmitting large amounts of current at possibly very high voltages. If a fault occurs on a transmission line and it is not cleared properly and quickly, the stability of the entire system can be compromised. The longer that the fault is allowed to remain on the line, the higher the possibility that the system will become unstable and possibly collapse. Calculating the magnitude of current that will flow through the transmission line at the time of the fault and configuring accurate settings for distance relays is a very important task that the protection engineer must perform in order to ensure the transmission line is properly protected. In order to do this, the protection engineer must first calculate the system impedance ratio and develop an equivalent electrical model of the transmission line. The system impedance ratio is a factor that needs to be considered when determining how to protect a transmission line and can greatly affect what will happen to a power system at the time of a fault. The system impedance ratio takes the source impedance of the system behind the transmission line and divides that by the line impedance that is being protected. If the system behind the transmission line has a strong source, the source impedance will be low. In this configuration, if a fault occurs on the transmission line, the fault current will be very high and the voltage will tend to remain stable. If the system behind the transmission line has a weak source, the source impedance will be higher. In this configuration, if a fault occurs on the transmission line, the fault current will be lower in magnitude and the line voltage will tend to drop. As you can see, the system impedance ratio is a very important factor in the stability of a power system. At the time of a fault, it must be considered when determining the type of protection needed and the speed at which the faults need to be cleared by relaying. When the current or voltage levels need to be accurately calculated at a specific point on the line, the protection engineer needs to draw an equivalent model of the transmission line. Different models of transmission lines are used for different lengths of line. These models are in three categories, short, medium, and long lines. The PI model shown here was historically used by the protection engineer to represent medium length lines. However, by using this representation of the line, in addition to computer-aided software now readily available, the protection engineer can accurately calculate all required values for both medium and long transmission lines. This data simplifies the protection engineer's task in performing fault calculations to set up the distance protection within a relay. Each component in a power system, whether it is a source, a transmission line, or a load, has an impedance. This total system impedance limits the magnitude of current that will flow through the power system. In the power system seen here, we have a total system impedance of 230 ohms. If the source were generating power at 230 kilovolts phase to neutral, 1,000 amps of current would be supplied to our load. If a fault were to occur on the power system in a location that would cut off the path of current flow to the load, the total impedance of our power system would change to only 23 ohms. Due to the drop in impedance, our current level would now increase substantially. The operating principle of distance protection for transmission lines works in the following way. The magnitude of current and voltage is measured at the beginning of the transmission line and using these measurements calculates a ratio of the voltage over the current. This ratio will then give you a value that is equal to the impedance of the total power system. When a fault occurs on the power system, thus cutting off the path of current to some of the load, the impedance of the power system will decrease. This decrease in impedance will cause the current to increase and the voltage to decrease slightly, thus changing the ratio of the voltage over the current to match the new impedance of the line. The voltage will decrease because the only voltage drops now occur across the transmission line and the source impedance. In this example, the fault is located after the transmission line but before the majority of the power system load. Now the only impedance on this power system is the impedance of the source and the transmission lines before the fault. When this fault occurs, the current flowing through the transmission line will increase. The ratio of voltage over current or impedance will now significantly decrease. Distance relays are programmed to know the impedance to the end of the transmission line. If the impedance the relay calculates is less than the impedance of the transmission line, the relay knows that the fault is on the transmission line itself and must trip the circuit. By comparing the calculated impedance of the transmission line with the known impedance of the transmission line, you can determine how far along the transmission line the fault occurred, leading to the term distance or distance relaying. In this example, the current increased as a result of the reduction in impedance from 20 to 10 ohms, indicating that the fault occurred at a distance of 50% of the distance from the measurement point to the end of the transmission line. The impedance of the line is often drawn on an RX diagram.
The x-axis represents the resistive component of the impedance of the line. The y-axis represents the inductive component of the impedance of the line in the positive direction and the capacitive component of the impedance of the line in the negative direction. The impedance of a transmission line is inherently mostly inductive. Therefore, if you were to plot the impedance of the line on this graph, it would be very close to the y-axis. If you were to draw a line from this point to the origin of the graph, you would have a representation of your entire transmission line. For example, plotting a point on the line midway between the origin and the end of the line would give an impedance of 10 ohms. This would also be the impedance of the midpoint of the transmission line. In a normal power system, there is a load at the end of the transmission line. Typically, this load is mostly resistive and is also larger than all of the other impedances of the power system. Therefore, if you were to plot the impedance of a power system under normal conditions on an RX diagram, the point would be shown very close to the x-axis. The distance from the origin would be the magnitude of impedance of the transmission line and the load. If a fault to the ground were to now occur at the midpoint on the transmission line, all of the impedances after the point of fault would no longer be part of the power system. The impedance of the system would now only be the impedance of the source plus the impedance of the part of the transmission line before the fault. Since the power system impedance is no longer mostly resistive because the only impedance is now the transmission line, which is mostly inductive, the plotting of the measured impedance on the RX diagram will be very close to the y-axis. The impedance point will actually fall along the line drawn from the origin to the impedance of the entire transmission line. Since the distance that the relay measures to the fault is actually closer than the length of the entire transmission line, the fault is in the zone that the relay is protecting, Therefore, the relay will send a signal to trip the breaker to clear the fault. The trip of a transmission line breaker normally initiates an auto-recloser sequence that works in conjunction with the synchrocheck function. The auto-recloser and synchrocheck functions are covered in detail in the distribution section of the CD. To program distance relays, you need to configure the impedance of the line, where any impedance less than this value will indicate a faulted line. This is done in modern distance relays by creating zones of operation on the RX diagram. If the impedance calculated at the point of measurement of the power system ever falls within this zone, the relay will trip. These zones fit into the following operating characteristics. An impedance zone, an admittance or MO circle zone, a reactance zone, a resistance zone, and a quadrilateral zone. Let's take a look at each of these operating characteristics for distance relaying operating zones. First, we will discuss the zone of protection known as an impedance zone. Any impedance that falls within the radius of the circle indicates a fault that needs to be cleared. The reach indicates in ohms how far on down the power system the zone of protection extends. This type of zone is inherently non-directional and will detect faults that occur in the reverse direction away from the point of measurement. This type of zone is normally used for generator backup protection. The zone of protection shown here is known as a reactance zone. This type of zone is used to detect when the impedance of the fault has a very high resistive component in it. If the fault does have a high resistive impedance, this indicates that there is a load on the transmission line and the fault is most likely not on the transmission line. This type of zone is usually never used to trip a transmission line on its own, but is normally used to supervise another distance zone of protection. For example, if an impedance zone detected the impedance of the line entering its zone of protection due to an external fault, the reactance zone can be used to block the impedance zone from tripping because it can determine that the impedance is mostly resistive and therefore the fault is not on the transmission line. The next zone of protection we will look at is a resistance zone. This type of zone is used to detect when the impedance of the fault has a very high inductive component in it. If the fault does have a high inductive impedance, this indicates that there is very little or no resistive load at the end of the transmission line and it is likely that the fault is located on the transmission line. This type of zone is usually never used to trip a transmission line on its own, but is normally used to supervise another distance zone of protection. For example, if an impedance zone detected the impedance of the line just slightly enter its zone of protection due to a fault occurring towards the end of its zone of protection, the resistive zone can be used to verify that the fault is actually on the transmission line because the impedance of the fault is mostly inductive. In this configuration, the resistance zone would be giving the impedance zone permission to trip. The next zone of protection is the admittance zone, or MO circle zone. A MO circle zone is the most common type of protection zone that is used in transmission line distance relays. 
A MOS circle zone detects whenever the impedance of the transmission line falls within the area defined by the circle. This type of zone is inherently directional and will not detect faults that fall in the reverse direction of the transmission line, since that point will fall outside of the circle. The reach of the zone of protection shows in impedance how far down the transmission line this zone of protection will protect. This reach always lies along the line of the impedance of the transmission line, which is usually around 75 to 80 degrees away from the x-axis. The reach is also the point in the circle that is the farthest away from the origin of the graph. One of the reasons that the most circle is positioned where it is along the graph is so the zone of protection will not trip on a power system that is highly loaded. For example, on the power system seen here, the reach of our MOS circle was programmed to be 18 ohms. Under normal circumstances, where there are no faults on the power system, the impedance of the power system will be very large, and the plotted measured impedance on the RX will be located close to the x-axis. If a substantial amount of load were now added to the power system, the current needed to feed the load would increase substantially, as seen here. Even though there is no fault on the transmission line, the newly calculated impedance of the line would be less than the reach of the MOS circle zone. However, since the load that was added is mostly resistive, the plotted impedance point would be much closer to the origin of the graph, but still very close to the x-axis. Since the MOS circle is positioned where it is on the graph, there is very little area included in the zone of protection in the resistance direction. Therefore, the new impedance will not fall into its zone of protection and the relay will not trip. Many advanced microprocessor-based relays, such as the URD60, gives the user the ability to further customize the shape of the MOS circle to meet their protection needs. For example, if this power system has instances where it can be heavily loaded, which may cause the impedance of the line to encroach into the MOS circle, the area of the circle may need to be changed to not include this area in the zone of protection. The MOS zone can be altered to form a lenticular shape, which looks at the magnitude of the impedance and only allows tripping when the impedance falls very close to the angle of the transmission line impedance. Therefore, highly loaded systems which cause the impedance point to approach very near the origin will not result in tripping the transmission line. As a side note, the D60 relay also gives the protection engineer the ability to configure the MO characteristic into what is known as a tomato-shaped zone. A tomato-shaped MO characteristic allows for faults that have more of a resistive element to fall into its zone of protection. Another custom zone is known as a quadrilateral zone of protection. This type of zone allows you to set the reactance and resistive upper and lower boundaries to create your own custom shape to match the needs of your power system. In this type of zone, there are essentially two reaches, one in the inductive direction and one in the resistive direction. Some advanced distance relays have added features to the MOS circle characteristic to increase security and reliability for faults that occur very close to the point of measurement, which is at the beginning of the transmission line. Again, this point of measurement is shown at the origin of the RX diagram. On faults that occur very close to the point where the currents and voltages are being measured, some relays may have difficulty distinguishing whether the fault is inside or outside their zone of protection. To overcome this difficulty, the relay can change the size of the MOS circle when the calculated impedance is very near the origin. This is sometimes referred to as an enhanced MO element. If a fault occurs just before the beginning of the transmission line, and the transmission line is double-ended or multi-ended, current will flow into the CT from the opposite direction. If the relay now calculates the impedance of the line, the value will be negative and plotting that impedance point will put it very near the origin but in the reverse direction to the transmission line. To make sure that the MO characteristic does not mistake this as being an internal fault, the relay recognizes the low impedance of the line, sees that the value is negative, and shrinks the radius of the circle. Since the MO circle is no longer near the origin and the location of the fault, there is no chance of the relay false tripping. Notice, however, that the reach of the MO circle did not change and still extends out to the end of the original zone of protection. If a fault occurs just after the beginning of the transmission line, current will flow into the CT from the positive direction. If the relay calculates the impedance of the line, the value will now be positive. Plotting that impedance point will put it very near the origin in the positive direction of the transmission line. To make sure that the MO characteristic does realize this as being an internal fault that needs to be cleared, the relay recognizes the low impedance of the line, sees that the value is positive, and enlarges the radius of the circle. Since the MOS circle now extends past the origin to include a larger area, 
the location of the fault is sure to fit in the zone of protection, therefore the fault can be cleared properly. Notice, however, that the reach of the Mohs circle did not change and still extends out to the end of the original zone of protection.